So in today's video, we're going to be talking about scoliosis, a really common condition with lots of misconceptions around it. So if you're ready, let's dive in. So a scoliosis is defined by a lateral curvature of the spine, which deviates from the normal vertical line. This most commonly presents in the thoracic spine and is often accompanied by an element of rotation of the vertebra as well. This condition can be categorized into several different types, congenital, neuromuscular, syndrome related or idiopathic. Congenital scoliosis results from malformations of the vertebra before the baby is even born. Neuromuscular disorders such as cerebral palsy or muscular dystrophy can cause scoliosis due to uneven muscle support. Conditions like Marfan syndrome and neurofibromatosis are examples of syndrome-related causes that may lead to scoliosis, which can be induced by factors like pain, spinal cord anomalies, tumors, and infections. However, idiopathic scoliosis, where there is no specific cause identified, is the most frequently observed type in medical settings, accounting for up to 80% of structural scoliosis cases. So lots of people get told that they have a scoliosis just from looking at the patient in a clinical examination. But how do we actually define the level and intensity of a scoliosis? Well, the idea is that we can use investigations like x-rays to measure the Cobb angle. So to measure the Cobb angle, the patient will have a PA x-ray of the spine where the x-ray is taken from behind and then some measurements are taken. Lines are drawn parallel to the upper border of the upper vertebral body involved in the curve and the lower border of the lowest vertebra involved in the curve. From these lines, the Cobb angle is measured to see the extent of the scoliosis. A Cobb angle of more than 10 degrees leads to a positive diagnosis of a scoliosis. A Cobb angle of more than 25 to 30 degrees is considered a significant scoliosis, and a Cobb angle of more than 45 degrees is considered a severe scoliosis and often requires more aggressive treatment because it can lead to issues such as organ compression, which naturally is going to be a problem for the patient. Now, a lot of the time within physiotherapy, we see patients who have what's called a functional scoliosis. This is where they either have a Cobb angle of less than 10 degrees, or they have a scoliosis which can change depending on their position, their posture, or range of movement. For example, we see lots of patients who come in very worried and anxious because they've been told that they have a scoliosis, but when you ask them to bend forward, their spine actually straightens. This is what we call a functional scoliosis because the ability for the scoliosis to change from its curved position to the neutral is a really good thing. We can reassure the patient that it's unlikely they're going to have huge, massive, structural, long-term changes because of the fact that we can actually change the shape of their scoliosis. So if a functional scoliosis is where we can change the curvature of the spine, depending on the patient's movement, posture, or positioning, a structural scoliosis is where the curvature doesn't change if you assess your patient and change their position, posture, or range of movement. And therefore, structural scoliosis and functional scoliosis have slightly different management strategies. So with a structural scoliosis where we can't necessarily improve the shape of the scoliosis, the aim may be to make sure that it doesn't worsen in the future. And therefore, this is where the orthopedic team will commonly be involved to measure the patient's Cobb angle at regular intervals to make sure it's not progressing. If it is progressing, they may use measures such as bracing or perhaps even surgery to limit the effect of the scoliosis on the patient's body and organs as well. But with a functional scoliosis, we're really grateful that we can make changes within physiotherapy. It may be that subtle muscle imbalances are causing the functional scoliosis in the first place, and therefore we might be able to use certain exercises like you can see here where we're focusing on strengthening the upper trunk muscles on one side, which can help develop the muscles on that side and thus potentially reduce the impact of the scoliosis, certainly reduce the amount of pain that the patient is in on a day-to-day -day basis. So therefore, within physiotherapy, it's really important that we first reassure and educate our patients who have a functional scoliosis to explain that we can make differences to their spine, that we can improve their pain and range of movement in order to help them for the future, knowing that they don't have to worry about long-term structural changes. Therefore, within our assessment, we'll be looking at which muscles are weak, both in the trunk, upper trunk, 
and in the lower trunk and the lower limb. And therefore, we might be strengthening the muscles which are weaker in both areas to try and see if we can improve those muscular imbalances for the future. So therefore, utilize exercises which are going to strengthen the upper trunk and scapula muscles on one side and that might strengthen the gluteal muscles and pelvic muscles on the other side to try and improve the scoliosis and improve your patient's symptoms. So everyone, I really hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, please support us by smashing that like button. Remember, you can subscribe to our channel here on YouTube. You can follow us on Instagram at Clinical Physio, where we have loads of resources for physiotherapists. And check out our website, clinicalphysio.com, for all the key tutorials you need within your musculoskeletal practice. My name's Khalid. Thank you so much for watching. See you soon here on Clinical Physio.